Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today we're going to be looking at the Canon EF 100mm f2.8 L IS USM macro lens for Canon's EF mount. This is their, uh, I would say, latest but last macro lens for the EF mount. And given that it's a macro lens with a fairly fast aperture, this might lend itself well to astrophotography. Macro lenses are typically known to be fairly flat field, hopefully pretty free of aberrations, and f2.8 is fairly fast, all things considered. With a 100 millimeter focal length here, you do get a bit of a wider field of view, and that can be really useful for taking big chunks of interesting parts of the sky. So I'm interested to see how this will do. One of the things that I really like about this lens is that it has a true manually coupled manual focus ring. It does do manual override so that if you're in AF mode, you can still just override the autofocus there. And I really do like that it gives you true control. Sometimes with the electronic manual focusing, it can be a little bit hard to really get things tight, especially if it's not a linear focus ring. So here, this is pretty good. The lens is pretty classic Canon, black, red ring. On the side here, we of course have a focus limiter. It is a macro lens, so it has a few different options there, as well as the AF-MF switch and the stabilizer switch, which I would suggest you keep turned off when you're doing astrophotography. All in all, it's a really nice lens. This hood has some felt flocking on the inside, which is quite nice. And it's nice and deep and not a pedal hood, so you don't have to worry about it flopping around if you, say, rest your lens down on a table or something like that. Behind the 67 millimeter filter thread, we find not quite a 67 millimeter front element, but 100 millimeters is fairly telephoto. We don't necessarily need a really wide front element, but it's going to be interesting to see if this affects vignetting at all. On the bottom here, we do have a little bit of a rubber gasket, so this can help with some weather sealing. And I'm not 100% sure on the whole lens in general, but that is at least nice to have, especially if you're in a dusty environment such as a desert or something to that effect. And while it doesn't come with the tripod foot, it does have a rail here for a tripod foot. And you can find both Canon expensive versions or like I did an inexpensive aftermarket version where you can hold that pretty securely and all things considered it's an L lens it's quite nice and they can be found on the used market for a fairly affordable price these days so it might be worth checking out if it's good or if it performs like you are happy with so without belaboring that too much. Let's just jump into Lightroom and see how it does. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom. Here I've got some samples with the Canon EF 100mm f2.8 L macro. Uh, this is the most recent version of that venerable EF lens to have been released. I've got two sets of samples here, one taken with the Sony a7R Mark V and one with the Canon R5. Now I've boosted the exposure a little bit because uh, as is my methodology, I try to take these samples at the let's say optimal ISO for astrophotography. For an A7R Mark V, uh, it only has two actual analog amplification stages, one at ISO 100 and one at 320. So since it's linear after 320, what I do is I uh, set it at 320. Uh, for the Canon R5, it looks like it's ISO 400. So they're very similar. Uh, the Canon files might be a little bit more exposed, just for that reason, I also noticed that when I imported them, corrections were auto-applied. When it comes to all of these samples, they will be made available for you. Check the description for a link and you should be able to get yourself full res copies of all of these. And as always, please uh, use them to assess the lens, but they are my copyrighted work. So please you know, don't spread them around, don't post them online, don't uh, misrepresent them as your own, etc., etc. I froze my butt off and put in some, some work to get these, so I appreciate if you'd respect that. That being said, we've got a f2.8 lens, so we're going to you know start from 2.8 and go to f4. 
Some other things to keep in mind, these are 60 second tracked exposures. They're all tracked with the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2 portable tracker. If you're not aware, Fervent Astronomy is Fornax Mounts exclusive North American distributor. So if you're interested in that, you can head over to fervinastronomy.com. But let's get into the samples here and see what we got to work with. So here we have the Sony a7R Mark V. It's a 60 megapixel sensor. Let's take a look right in the middle. And here we see that you know, the stars are decently round. It doesn't look like there's any aberrations that are affecting shape this far in the middle. A little bit of fringing here. That is probably just some chromatic aberration. Uh, you will get that on some stars. Here we've got, I can't quite remember what this is, to be honest. Well, I'm not going to worry about it right now. You can plate solve it if you want to find out the, uh, the view. This was pretty close to zenith because I was trying to make sure I got the clearest sky possible. Very little bloating here, uh, so spherical aberrations I don't believe are much of an issue. If we go take a look here, you can see that there is vignetting wide open here at f2.8. The corners are quite a bit darker. You know, usually macro lenses are known for being rather flat field, not having a lot of distortion or field curvature. So we, and those are two different things by the way. So we'll check that out. First thing though, we'll check in the corners and oh, here we got some stretched out stars. So this I know a lot of you are thinking coma, uh, but if you haven't watched one of my reviews before, you'll be disabused of that. This is actually something called tangential astigmatism. There are two types of astigmatism, and uh, essentially astigmatism is the inability for the lens to focus light at a point. So tangential astigmatism radiates out from the center of the frame to the corners, and it will change direction. If we go here, we see that there's some elongation in that direction. Go in the other corner, we see that there's some elongation towards that direction. So what you get is this radius sort of effect. And the stars stretching out are uh, along that radius. You also have sagittal astigmatism, which to be honest, I'm not really seeing much. You will get sort of a, if you look over here to the navigator, sagittal follows a ring around the center of the lens basically. So it's always at a, a right angle to the tangential astigmatism. So it will always basically might cross these little things as T's or make them look like little birds. But overall, I don't really see much. I'm pretty consistent. Oh, here, here's a little bit of sagittal astigmatism. You can see they're kind of in a different axis here. So you'll get it on the brighter stars. The brighter the stars, the more it'll show up. Here's a really good example, actually. So you're getting some, some wonkiness happening here. And generally, the way that this affects the image is it will make these stars along the edges look bigger than they actually are. So you can see here this star looks bigger than it actually should be. Get rid of those those tines and it would be a lot more compact. And that just has the effect of making stars around the edges of the screen look a little bit bigger and stars look a little tighter, a little more uh, smaller and consistent towards the middle here. So it can tend to you know give a bit of a distortion effect. For big stars like this where they're really bright have that issue you can just kind of clone them into a circular shape if you're not you know against that type of thing uh, when you get it really severe and it starts to get spread around everywhere or encroach on the middle of the frame it can be bad news here we do get some shapes here these almost look like little mini rocket pops or, or candy corn shapes from proper viewing distance those are going to look just like a point like any other star but you can see that they seem to be radiating out from the center to the edges as they'll change direction I don't really think there's any coma. Coma or comatic aberration is an aberration that you might feel like it could be happening here, but where you'll have a star and it will turn into a little point or a little V, a little triangle shape, and it will get a fuzzy tail. And that fuzzy tail will either point into the middle of the lens for internal coma or out to the edges for external coma. And it will follow that same line that the tangential astigmatism does. I know these are, are reminiscent of that shape, but they just don't have the, the fuzzy tail. And I think what we have here with the little bit of fuzziness here is actually chromatic aberration. You can see there's a splitting between more of a uh, warmer red color on the outer edge and this greener cyan on the inner edge. I think that's some uh, chromatic aberration happening there. So overall, for an older macro lens, not bad, I guess. It's definitely not completely free edge to edge. Uh, anything nearing perfect, but usually lenses never are. For an acceptable field of view, as you get in here, if you look in the navigator where we are, we still get some changing of the star shapes. However, 
when viewed at a reasonable person's viewing distance, they're not so bad. And even these bigger ones, I don't think uh, would really be much of an issue. That said, this is f2.8, so we can look in the center, 2.8, 3.2, 3.5, F4, here we're starting to get that bit of sun star effect on, uh, on our bright stars. And we'll just go check the corner here. That's 2.8, 3.2, 3.5, and 4. And here we see what dual stigmatism might have been present, kind of tightened up here a little bit. I think mostly because of the darkening, but we really haven't resolved the tangential astigmatism. Let's go check out these stars since that a little bit more. It's 2.8, 3.2, 3.5, you see things are starting to normalize a little bit in F4. And now we're getting, ignore the fact that it's different colors, but we're getting more consistent reproduction here. So it's gonna show up as more of a round shape when viewed from distance. Same thing with this one. And it is what it is. We're gonna go into the develop module and we're going to remove the chromatic aberration. Let's see what happens. Didn't make a huge difference. Maybe a little galaxy. Yeah, it's trying a little bit. Let's go over here. I know we had some like this. It's helping better there. So for something like this, if it really needed some extra help, you could come into the manual corrections and just defringe yourself. Although you have to be careful because it can sometimes cause issues with other stars. It'll start to make some blotchiness, like you can see this here. I'm going to back up, and you can see there's a kind of a red patch that's around the star here. And if we go back, that red patch is gone. So you can cause some issues around some stars where it essentially is trying to combat something that's not really there, and it can make blotches around some of the stars. So you have to be careful with that. And we will enable profile corrections. And you can see there's very little distortion here. I'm going to flip it on and off a couple of times. And yeah, you know, the lens is very flat. Uh, I will give it that. So with it on, it looks like it's maybe reversing a little bit of pin cushion distortion there. Pin cushion being that the center of the field is sort of pushed in towards the star field uh, or in uh, away from the, the viewer. So it has to change the dimensions, do a little bit of a transformation to, to flatten it out. But overall, it doesn't look like there's much of an issue at all there. Now, one thing that I didn't mention, but I don't see it as being an issue, is field curvature, different from distortions. So distortions are where straight lines don't stay straight. So you can think if it was pin cushion here, it kind of looks like it's, uh, when I undid that, pushing away from you a little bit, and it pulls away, it pulls toward when I turn it back on. So that changes uh, how straight the lines are in, in the photo. So you can imagine if this was a brick wall, maybe the bricks would dip down as they go toward the center from the edges there. But field curvature is an entirely different matter. Your lens is made up of rounded shapes for the most part, and it's trying to project an uh, image onto a flat surface. Those things don't really jive too well. So what you can actually get is when the center is in focus, the edges are out of focus and vice versa. Somewhere you might even have a ring around the frame at a different spot that might be in a different plane of focus. But as you would hope from macro lens, this doesn't seem to be the case here. And that means you'll get a nice flat field from edge to edge. Now let's go look at the Canon files here. So this is with the R5 and you can tell there's a, a little bit of a, a change in the star field there. We did these at a different point, and we've got some galaxies here. You know what? Just go in the center of the frame and both. It doesn't really appear to be that different of a reproduction. Definitely have a little bit more exposure. I shouldn't say exposure, but it's a little brighter because the ISO value is set higher. Of course, everything that we talked about applies uh, still. And hello. So we still have all these little, I don't know what you'd call them, little little shapes. Not feeling too creative today, sorry. So if we enable profile corrections, again, it really cleans everything up. Uh, one thing that it does as well uh, that I didn't mention 
a minute ago is besides fixing some of those distortions, you're also remedying the vignetting. And this is pretty darn useful, right? Where there were dark corners and a brighter center, it's now really helping to automatically even that out. And here is where you're gonna get more noise. You see we have, a, now that's brightened up, a lot of triangular shapes are, are more evident. But you're gonna get more noise here in the corners than you would in the center just because the corners here are underexposed relative to the center. However, the R5, I believe, is doing a decent job here applying some very selective denoise to kind of keep things a little bit more consistent. You can uh, see this for yourself. There's a perhaps a bit of a, a difference in, in texture. It's a little bit coarser over here. And if we pop back to the Sony. Now here, interestingly enough, we're not getting the same vignetting improvements. So you can imagine you're going to have to come in here and do a little bit of manual vignetting adjustment to sort of improve things. There is a bit of a extra step, a little extra manual step there, but you know what? You can still get away with it if you don't mind doing it. And this type of vignetting removal is going to be consistent for pretty much every frame you, you take at that aperture. So this is something you could save as a preset if you'd like, and then just apply it. Obviously, one manufacturer is going to have uh, better lens profiles optimized for their, their files as opposed to adapting that same lens onto another manufacturer's camera. That being said, the optical performance of the lens can't be changed, and it's going to be consistent amongst any brand of camera that you use. And of course, as long as you have those corrections on or off, you'll know kind of what you can expect to get there. There you go. So I'm not going to go through these ones here. It's going to be the same for the most part. So if you're interested, those samples will be available for you. Just check the description for a download link. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. So what'd you think? Honestly, from my point of view, it's not bad, especially considering where it can be had used these days price wise. So this might be a good option. I'd be super chuffed if it was like really, really clean corner to corner and just perfectly flat field and that type of thing. You know, for a lens that does have that red ring and the L moniker, you would love to have that, but optics can be difficult. And here there are some extra compromises that have to be made, such as the image stabilization. So I'm actually pretty pleased overall with the results, but that's just my opinion. You're the final say on what works best for you. So if you feel like this lens might be the lens for you, either new or used, well, now you know. So thanks so much. I've been Darren with Fervent Astronomy, and we'll see you in the next one.